I have remembered my covenant. This is lesson number 13 for March 21st through 27th. And it's based on Exodus chapters 1 through 6. Let's talk about the book of Exodus. Now, you're probably familiar with this book because of the epic story of Moses leading Israel out of slavery from Egypt. Yeah, but that's just the first half of the book. The second half has Moses giving the Ten Commandments to Israel along with these blueprints for making a sacred tent. Now, right here in the middle is the story that connects these two halves together, and it all takes place at the foot of a famous mountain. Okay, so let's start back at the beginning. So the first thing we have to remember is we're continuing the story from Genesis. Yeah, in Genesis, God promised Abraham that through his family, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And Genesis ends with Abraham's family down in Egypt. When Exodus begins, 400 years have passed, the family grows, and becomes the people group now called Israel. But there's this huge problem because the Israelites are enslaved to this king of the Egyptians, a guy called Pharaoh. This guy is really bad news. Yeah, he's horrible. He, he disregards their humanity. He brutally enslaves them. And he even orders that all of the Israelites' sons should be killed by throwing them into the Nile River. He wants to wipe these people out. He's the worst character in the Bible so far. Here's where we meet an Israelite woman who wants to save her son. And so she does throw him in the river, but safely in this little reed basket. And Pharaoh's daughter finds this baby and takes him as her own. And this is the boy who grows up to become Moses, the man who will rescue Israel from slavery. So Moses grows up and one day, much later in his life, he has this crazy encounter with God where he comes across a bush that's on fire but it isn't actually burning up. And God speaks from the bush, and he appoints Moses as the man he will use to deliver Israel. So Moses goes to Pharaoh to tell him this, this news that God wants his people free. And Pharaoh, he just pretty much laughs at him. He's like, Who, who's this God, Yahweh? And in fact, he's so offended by this request, he decides to make the Israelites work even harder. So discouraged, Moses goes back to God and says, listen, this plan's not going to work. But God repeats his promise that he's going to rescue them. And in fact, it's right here for the first time in the Bible that we hear the word redemption. It literally just means to purchase a slave's freedom. But God here uses this word to describe what he's going to do for enslaved Israel. And God knows Pharaoh is going to resist. So he sends 10 different plagues, one after another, like turning water into blood, sending all sorts of pests and disease. These plagues are really severe. They are severe, but we need to understand that the story is presenting these as acts of divine justice against one of the worst oppressors in the story of the Bible. And they're all aimed at the purpose of rescuing these enslaved people and defeating the gods of Egypt. This all comes to a climax at the 10th plague, where God's going to kill the firstborn sons across all Egypt. Every house, it's pretty rough. It is, but it's also God's response for how Pharaoh killed the Israelite sons. Now, as you turn the page, you suddenly get two long chapters of detailed instructions for what's essentially throwing a dinner party with a recipe for a lamb. Yeah, but this lamb is super important. God tells the Israelites to pick it out and to prepare it to be eaten. And they're supposed to take its blood and then paint it all over the doorframe of their house. And anyone who is in that house will be spared from this final plague. And so this meal, which is called Passover, it commemorates this key moment in the story where God brings his justice on human evil, but also shows mercy by providing this substitute. This final plague makes Pharaoh angry and he demands that Israel gets out of Egypt, which is great. But suddenly as they leave, Pharaoh changes his mind. He has a change of heart. But on top of that, we're also told that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Why would God do that? Well, what we need to remember is that over and over in this story, Pharaoh has already chosen to harden his own heart. And so at this point, Pharaoh, he's not just evil, he's become monstrously evil. Even his own advisors think that he has gone way too far. And so how is God supposed to deal with such an extreme form of evil? And what we see in this story is that God uses his power to lure evil into its own destruction. Pharaoh and his army are destroyed in the Red Sea as Israel passes into freedom. And after this, we find the very first song of worship in the Bible as the people praise God for redeeming them. And it's in this story that the word salvation is also used for the first time, which means simply to be rescued from danger. Now that they're saved, you would think that everything should be great. 
but the story quickly turns. The Israelites start wandering in the desert. They're tired, hungry, lost. And you start to wonder, what's God doing? What were they saved for? And we learn the answer to that question in the very next story, which ties the two parts of this whole book together. The children of Israel are forced into slavery. And this is taken from Exodus in the very first chapter, verses 7 through 11. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them. Let us, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when they there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them. Did God forget the covenant he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? We can learn a little bit about this in our current uh, time frame in Doctrine and Covenants section 88, verse 68. Therefore sanctify yourself that your minds become single to God, and the days will come that ye shall see him, for he shall will unveil his face unto you, and it shall be in his own time, and in his own way, and according to his own will. God remembers the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land. So how is the Lord going to deliver Israel? Well, this person by the name of Moses, who is from the tribe of Lehi, will be that person. We can read some insights in the book of Jasher, chapter 68, verse 1. The Spirit of God was upon Miriam, the daughter of Amram, the sister of Aaron, and she went forth and prophesied about the house, saying, Behold, a son will be born unto us from my father and mother this time, and he will save Israel from the hands of Egypt. We can see the genealogy of Moses. We see that we have Abraham has a son Isaac, who has Jacob, who is now renamed Israel. He has all of his children, those uh, tribes, what we call the tw uh, 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, it's Levi, who is the um, person who marries a um, wife who has a daughter. They have a daughter named Jochebed. And uh, Jochebed um, is going to be the wife of his, his grandson, Amron. And um, that is the person who will give birth to Aaron, uh, Miriam, and Moses. We can see that God is using symbolism here to help us understand that God has the power to free his people from oppression. And that person is really Jesus Christ, who is our deliverer. And we can see if we look at chapters 1 and 2 in Exodus and compare the, the, what goes on there with the role of Jesus Christ, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. Israel was enslaved. Jesus makes us free. We are enslaved due to sin and death. Jesus redeems us from sin and death. Moses delivered the Israelites from physical bondage. Jesus frees us from spiritual bondage. Moses was preserved from death as an infant. For example, we can read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, and when the mother could no longer hide Moses, she took him in an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's bank brink. And in um, the uh, book of Matthew, Jesus was preserved from death as an infant. When we read, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. 
As we do the Lord's work, we can have the Lord's power. We can read this in verses 10 and 11. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? So how did the Lord respond to Moses' concerns about the task of delivering the Israelites from bondage? Well, some things that are going on here in this text is that God actually listens to Moses' concerns and gives him evidence, visual evidence, that God ultimately is in charge. We have these interesting uh, cases where, again, Moses wanting evidence that God's going to be with him. Verse 2, the Lord says to Moses, what is that in thine hand? And Moses says, a rod. God tells him, throw it on the ground and then pick it up again. Well, Moses throws it on the ground and it turns into a snake. Of course, most of us would do what Moses did. He runs away. Who wants to get bit by a snake? And then God says, put your, forth your hand. And I love that Moses appears to overcome his fear and trust the Lord enough to grab the snake, which becomes a rod again. Now, what's interesting here is that we have evidence in the ancient world, in ancient Egypt, of magicians who were able to play tricks on people where they could actually make snakes go stiff, that you could actually hold it almost like a rod. Here you actually have God doing the opposite of turning a rod into a snake, not a snake into a rod, which God also seems to do. And it's almost a sign that God is far better than the Egyptian magicians who can only make a snake go stiff. God can actually turn a rod into a snake. That's part of the message here. And yet Moses still is a little concerned, like, am I, am I really supposed to be doing this? Am I really supposed to be going forward with this, uh, this mission and this message to the Pharaoh? God tells him, verse 5, I do this that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. This phrase is really important. It's a reminder that we can trust God, and that is what God wants Moses to do, and by extension, all of us who follow the Lord through the teachings of Moses or any other prophet. So God gives him yet more examples to trust him. He says, Moses, put your hand in your bosom and then pull it out, and he takes it out. It's leprous. What's interesting here is that God yet has to convince Moses to trust him. Verse 9, if they will not believe these two signs, or if they don't hearken unto thy voice, thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. Okay? You would think that all these things would convince Moses and others, and yet in verse 10, Moses says, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. So Moses still doesn't feel like he's ready to fulfill God's mission. And many of us feel this way, that we may not feel ready for life circumstances. And it's interesting here, God says to him, verse 11, who hath made man's mouth or who maketh the dumb or the deaf or seen or the blind have not I the Lord. God basically says, I'm in charge. I've made everything. You are my son or my daughter, whatever the case might be. I have called you to this work and I can empower you to do the work. So this is one of the great outcomes, I think, the lessons from, from this text here is that God takes the time to listen to our concerns, and sometimes he might lose his patience a bit. It seems like even in the story of Moses, he was a bit flustered with Moses not getting the message. And yet, God persists with us. He will take the time to work with us where we're at and to give us evidences to trust him. This is one of the key points of the entire Old Testament, is God wanting to reveal his trustworthy character to us, that he is fully trustworthy. And we can learn from Moses, the children of Israel, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that when we trust God, God will work things to our favor. He will remove the chaos of our lives and bring us to lands of promise. Another great lesson we can learn from Exodus is found in Exodus chapters, chapter 3, verse 5, where Moses is now um, on the mount and he sees a burning bush. And the Lord comes to him and says, And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. 
So we have a concept here that there are sacred places and sacred events. We can read something similar to that in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 6, verses 10 through 12, regarding Joseph Smith. And the Lord says to him, Behold thou, Joseph Smith, you have a gift, and blessed art thou because of thy gift. Remember, it is sacred and cometh from above. And if thou wilt inquire, thou shalt know mysteries, which are great and marvelous. Therefore, thou shalt exercise thy gift, that thou mayest find out mysteries, that thou mayest bring many to the knowledge of the truth. Yea, convince them of the error of their ways. Make not thy gift known unto any, save it be those who are of thy faith. Trifle not with sacred things. Another concept that we learn in the book of Exodus is who is Jehovah? In Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, it says, And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. We can read similarly in Doctrine and Covenants, section 29, verse 1. Listen to the voice of Jesus Christ, your Redeemer, Redeemer, the great I am, whose armor mercy hath atoned for your sins. We can read in the Joseph Smith translation the following in chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now sh shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he dry them out of his land. And God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob. I am the Lord God Almighty, the Lord Jehovah. And was not my name known unto them? Now compare that to the King James Version in verse 3, where it says, By my name Jehovah was I not known unto them. So there's a clear distinction that Joseph Smith inspired version says that Jehovah was known unto the uh, children of Israel. The symbolism of the book of Exodus continues when Jehovah says, I will rid you out of the bondage of the Egyptians, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. So Moses repeatedly used his rod in a stretched out arm for deliverance from physical bondage. Christ's delivery was on the cross where his arms were stretched out in mercy to free us from spiritual bondage. In Exodus 9 and in Exodus 17, Moses performed a strange gesture by raising his hands above his head. In Exodus chapter 9, Moses told Aaron that he would raise his hands above his head unto the Lord to stop the plague of thunder and hail. I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know how the earth is the Lord's. In Exodus 17, Moses had to keep his arms raised during an entire battle in order for the Israelites to defeat the Amalekites. Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. When Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. While this gesture may seem strange to us, it's a very ancient and sacred gesture for prayer and approaching the power of God. Today, most Latter-day Saints pray by folding their arms and bowing their heads in a show of reverence. But in ancient Israel, praying sometimes took the form of raising your hands toward heaven. Archaeologists and scholars have discovered this hand gesture in ancient cultures spanning thousands of years, from ancient Egypt all the way to Christian Rome. This gesture has meant different things in different contexts and cultures, but there are pieces of evidence in the Bible, Ugarit, and surrounding ancient Near Eastern cultures that suggest that this gesture was one of powerful prayer with temple connections. In the ancient city of Ugarit, the god El instructed a hero to lift his hands to heaven in order to approach the god Baal. An Aramaic inscription told of a king named Hamath, who also lifted his hands to heaven to pray to the god Baal. We have ivory carvings and stamp seals from Ugarit and the Northern Levant depicting people with raised hands, often in gestures of prayer, supplication, or veneration. In a tomb painting from Egypt, Semitic figures can be seen supplicating Pharaoh for the breath of life by raising their hands. 
The Bible contains many examples of people raising their hands as a sacred gesture of prayer or praise and had strong connections with the temple. For example, when King Solomon dedicated God's holy temple, he offered the dedicatory prayer by standing before the altar and spreading his hands towards God. The Psalms are sometimes referred to as the hymn book of the ancient temple, and they contain many examples of this gesture in connection with the temple. For example, Psalm 28 declares, Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands towards thy holy oracle, or the temple. Psalm 134 says, Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Psalm 141 says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. In Exodus chapter 9, when Moses lifted up his hands unto the Lord, it was a supplication for the Lord's almighty power, and the Lord responded. He miraculously stopped the thunder and hail. Similarly, when Moses raised his hands during the Amalekite battle, he was invoking God's power to save Israel. Moses was God's emissary on the earth and had the authority to petition God's power for his people. By raising his hands to heaven, Moses signaled to Pharaoh and the Amalekites that God was with Moses. God's power was manifest in the thunder and hail and in the victory of battle. When we pray to God with sacred gestures, we can signal to God our humility and worthiness before him. We can praise him and we can rest assured that God is with us. As Dieter F. Uchtdorf taught, Lift up your soul in prayer and explain to your Heavenly Father what you are feeling. Acknowledge your shortcomings. Pour out your heart and express your gratitude. Let him know of the trials you are facing. Plead with him in Christ's name for strength and support. Ask that your ears may be opened, that you may hear his voice. Ask that your eyes may be opened, that you may see his light. The next lesson is Remember This Day in Which We Came Out from Egypt, taken from Exodus chapters 7 through 13, lesson number 14 for March 28th through April the 3rd. In Genesis chapters 7 through 12, we learn about the 10 plagues of Egypt. We learn in chapter 7, the water turning into blood. From chapters uh, 8, we get the frogs, the lice, and the flies. In chapters 9, we get uh, the sick cattle along with the boils and the fire and the hail. Chapter 10, we have the locusts, then darkness. Then after the darkness comes a very important chapter in chapter 12, which is the death of the firstborn. All of these are representations of what the Lord says, In this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. So Passover is an important part of the book of Exodus, and its significance can be a source of, again, symbolism on how our Savior is that Paschal Lamb. So Passover is the first month known as Nisan, and we can read this in that chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. This is their religious month. They have a civil month as well, civil, a civil uh, calendar, but this is their, their um, uh, religious calendar. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth month of this month, they shall take to them every male a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make you count for the lamb. And your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep, or from the goats, and you'll, you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses, where, when, wherein they shall eat it.
Ancient Egypt, land of the pharaohs. 3,000 years ago, it was the mightiest empire on the face of the earth. Today, we catch only a glimpse of the majesty of ancient Egypt and the glory of its pharaoh. They were rich and powerful beyond imagination. They commanded the greatest army the world had ever known. It was in the time of these mighty pharaohs that the children of Israel were slaves in ancient Egypt, living out their lives in misery and bondage. Not even plagues called down by Moses softened the pharaoh's heart to free Israel from their captivity. What power could deliver them from the mighty hand of Pharaoh? And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat the lamb. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roast with fire. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until morning, and that which remaineth of it until morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So the Passover was implemented on the 14th day of the re first religious month, which is called Nisan, or anciently was called Abed. And it's to remind the house of Israel that Jesus Christ or the Lamb of God would be offered as an atoning sacrifice for their sins. Just as the blood of the innocent lamb that was sprinkled on the doorposts of Jewish homes caused the destroying angel to pass over those homes during the last plagues of on Egypt. So those covered by the blood of the Lamb of God will escape spiritual death. The Lord's Supper was a Passover meal that passed the symbolic bread to each apostle in order to eat in remembrance of his body. Jesus would present himself as the ultimate Passover or Paschal Lamb. And the Passover and the atonement and the sacrifice and the sacrament can be compared. For example, the blood of the Lamb saves Israel from the physical death, and of course the blood of Lamb of God, who is Christ, saves all from physical and spiritual death. In Exodus 13 we see the following, and thou shalt therefore keep this Passover ordinance in his season from year to year. And in the Joseph Smith a translation of Matthew, I give unto you a commandment that you shall observe to do this thing, the sacrament which you have seen me do. The male lamb required without blemish or broken bones. Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, was without blemish or broken bone. And they shall eat the lamb's flesh in that night, roast with fire and, with, and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. In John 6, it says, Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. The Passover meal included saying a blessing before drinking wine and blessing the unleavened bread before breaking and eating it. The emblems of the sacrament are blessed prior to partaking of them. The unleavened bread was broken. The bread of life was without hypocrisy, and his body was broken in death. Sacrament bread is broken. The Passover wine was mixed with water. 
One of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. We read that in John chapter 19, verse 34. No leavened bread was allowed in the house during Passover. And in 1 Corinthians, we read, No hypocrisy is allowed in partaking of the sacrament. The Egyptian firstborn son dies for the Pharaoh's sin. Heavenly Father's firstborn dies for the sins of all people. Moses delivers children of Israel from physical bondage. Jesus Christ delivers the children of men from spiritual bondage. The Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of the First Fruits are also representative in the Passover prophecy and its fulfillment. For example, on the eve of Passover, Jews begin to remove all leaven from their houses. And after the Last Supper and betrayal, Christ is found worthy to be cast out. On sunrise, the leaven must be eaten until midday, then it is strictly forbidden. Jesus' preparation was for the crucifixion on that morning. The slaughter of the Paschal lambs begins at midday and continues until sundown. The crucifixion begins at noon, and death occurs in the ninth hour, which is around three o'clock. In sunset, the first sheaf is cut down and the Paschal lamb is consumed. In Christ's time, his body was entombed. The Paschal um, Sabbath was at sunrise, and in the morning, the first sheaf of the first proofs is lifted up before the Lord, and Christ was re resurrected on that morning, the first fruits of the dead, and the tomb is now empty. The Book of Mormon uh, has quite a, a lot about the law of Moses and especially about sacrificing of lambs. For example, in Messiah chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and they took the firstlings of their flocks that they might offer sacrifice and burnt offerings according to the law of Moses. Here I have three examples uh, in the red rectangular boxes how this works. And these twelve ministers whom thou beholdest shall judge thy seed, and behold, they are righteous forever. For because of their faith in the Lamb of God, their garments are made white in his blood. That's in First Nephi chapter 12, verses 10. That's the words of an angel. Now in Alma chapter 5, verse 21, we read the following. I say unto ye, you will know at that day that ye cannot be saved, for there could be no man saved except his garments are washed white. Yea, his garments must be purified until they are cleansed from all stain through the blood of him whom it has been spoken of by our fathers who should come to redeem his people from their sins. And in Ether chapter 13, verse 10, we read, And blessed are they who dwell therein, for it is they whose garments are white through the blood of the Lamb. And they are they who are numbered among the remnant of the seed of Joseph, who were of the house of Israel. Finally, these plagues that we're reading in Exodus have a, an allusion to what we read about the final days before the millennium in the book of Revelation. And uh, there's some plagues that are talked about in the book of Revelation that relate to the plagues that were given to Egypt. And these relate to the seven trumpets and the seven angels. And I have a listing here, but just an overview, we've got the thunder and the hail and the fire mingled with hail destroys trees and herbs. That's in Exodus chapter 9. And we read it again in, uh, when the angels sound their trumpet, hail, fire mingled with blood destroys one-third of the trees and green grass. Again, we continue the third part of the seed becomes blood. Seed life is a third of it is destroyed in all the ships and so forth. And in Exodus, we, all the waters in Egypt were turned to blood. And the fish died and the river stank. Uh, we've got in Revelation 8, a uh, third part of the rivers and fountains of water became bitter. Uh, all the waters in Egypt were turned to blood and the fish died and the river stank. We've got in Revelation 8, uh, night and day darkened by a third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the stars being darkened. In Exodus, where there was a thick darkness in the land for three days, they saw not one another. Revelation 9, smoke from bodiless Pit releases locusts from which tor torment men for five months with the sting of their tails. In uh, Exodus uh, 
chapter 10, we get the east wind brings locusts, which destroy for fruit and eat every herb of the field. Nothing green was left. In Revelation 4, destroying angels released to slay one-third of men. An army of 200 million horsemen kill one-third of the men. And in Revelation, frogs come up abundantly and cover the land of Egypt and entered into their homes, bedchambers, ovens, kneading troughs. And finally, in Revelation 10 and 11, we get the seventh angel sounds. The mystery of God should be finished as he declared to the prophets. And in Exodus 9, thunder and hail and fire mingled with hail, broke every tree and smote every herb. So I'm here to testify that what we learn in the book of Exodus has great bearing on what we do today. The symbolism that is set forth in those books are something that we can symbolically do in every Sunday when we partake of the sacrament. The broken bread and the water that we partake of in the sacrament is a representation of that blood of the lamb that was killed and eaten uh, during Passover. And we pray that as we renew our covenants with him at the waters of baptism and renew our covenants, and when we partake of the sacrament, that we can remember that the Lord can deliver us from our bondage of sin. And this I say in Jesus Christ's name, amen.